Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Standing on the north bank of the River Thames, approximately 13 miles southwest of London, Hampton Court Palace is one of England's historical treasures. Originally owned by Cardinal Wolsey in 1525, it was acquired by King Henry VIII, who immediately set about enlarging and redesigning it. At the time of Henry's death in 1547, there are more than 2,000 tapestries in the collection, the gradual dispersal of which probably began soon after this date, though the acquisition of tapestries continued during the reigns of James I and Charles I. <clears throat> About 50 tapestries now remain at Hampton Court, but it remains one of the most important and significant collections in existence today. Maintenance of the tapestries was carried out by the King's Great Wardrobe, where regular repairs and relining were undertaken from as early as 1524 until its closure in 1782. Little is known about the care of the royal tapestries since then and the end of the 19th century. This presentation sets out to describe the developments and changes in the repair and treatment of the Hampton Court tapestries during the 20th century. The technical approach and philosophy has continually strived to reflect the needs of a fixed collection on permanent open display and increasingly subjected to high visitor numbers within a highly competitive market. After 1737, increasingly sporadic use of the palace influenced the future management of the collection, and by the mid-19th century, the tapestries were considered to be mo no more than rich wall hangings, and many were even covered over with papered linen, providing a backdrop for the more fashionable collection of paintings. Uninterrupted display since about 1700 had resulted in a general state of decay in the entire de collection. Eventually, the aftermath of two fires in the early 1880s led to the realization that action must be taken before the collection was irreparably damaged, even lost. In 1885, after much discussion, repairs were carried out at Hampton Court by a team of 13 needlewomen, increasing to 17 in 1886, after which just four women were kept on. And this is a detail of the tapestry, the Triumph of Death, which is currently in storage, that was damaged by, in that fire, or one of the fires. Um, and you can see patches and general um, badly undertaken repairs. And another detail of actually painted repairs. In 1908, renewed interest continuing and continuing uh, concerns with the tapestries led to the director of the Gobelin Tapestry Manufactory in Paris, advising that the task of renovation should be entrusted to the most competent people in the world under the management of a body of experts. Therefore, in 1912, under the direction of the historian H.C. Marillier, and with highly skilled weavers from the Merton Abbey workshops, the William Morris Company set up a workroom at Hampton Court as the collection was considered too valuable and fragile to be transported elsewhere. And this is dated about 1930, and there the restorers working in the Queen's Guard Chamber. And this is um, a lady called Betty Creasy, and Marillier, uh, restoring uh, the Chan of Sarah tapestry, dated somewhere between 1927 and 32. And Mrs. Creasy was actually the supervisor in the workroom when I joined in 1978. Their remit was to clean, restore the tapestries and train apprentices. The first to undergo repairs in the new workshop were the five early 16th century Dido and Aeneas uh, panels, completed in 1913. There are no records detailing the extent of this or any other restoration work until 1978, other than start and finish dates. Marillier continued to manage the weavers after the closure of Morris and Company in 1940, <coughs> excuse me, up to 1947, when the workroom became a government department under the Ministry of Works. The restorers continued to work diligently on the collection, employing two methods of treatment. Reweaving was a traditional technique. This radical method involved the removal of all weak and damaged areas, and new weft threads needle woven into what remained of the original structure, emulating the, the original design and colour as far as possible. And here you can see an area that's been woven up to the bottom. I apologise for the colour here. But you can see new warps going in. 
sewing through that crack. Around here. And the original up in these areas that would have been totally removed by the re uh, reweavers. Although this work was technically sound, progress was slow and often resulted in a definitive and irreversible loss of the fine original detail. A second technique sometimes used was called cobbling, the restorer's terminology. Now this is cobbling onto a patch, actually the back of the tapestry, and you can see where it's very randomly carried out and has actually caused further damage. I'm sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. There we go. Just around here, you can see bare warps where the silk has fallen out since this repair was done. The repairs were sometimes onto linen patches, uh, placed behind weak areas, with little regard to the tapestry design. The method was usually chosen for speed of work over quality and was disliked by the restorers, who always considered their needle weaving as doing it properly. By the early 1970s, the Royal Collection concluded that this repair program could not keep up with the rate of decay. The restoration work was hampered by diminishing stocks of very old Morris yarns that were difficult to colour match, light fugitive, and often broke as the restorers worked. By now, only two restorers remained, both apprentices at Hampton Court and now quite elderly, having been kept on way beyond their retirement dates. It became increasingly difficult to recruit apprentices and trained restorers were non-existent. With the original skills and resources of the Merton Abbey weavers diminishing, restoration as a concept was at best only superficially effective, and at worst, it inflicted deliberate loss of original detail. Um, you've seen part of, um, the whole of this tapestry before. This is the detail. And it actually shows um, really quite crude rewoven re repairs on these faces where a huge amount of original detail has been lost. And again, this is from the Battle of Sol Bay um, tapestries were actually restored in the 1920s. Again, you can see areas of restoration here, which has faded dramatically. And these two images were actually used as a case to be put forward to, for that change from restoration into conservation. Meanwhile, new working methods introduced by institutions like the Victoria and Albert Museum and the newly formed Textile Conservation Centre were widely acknowledged. And so by the mid-1970s, with the support of the Royal Collection, a new influx of gradual apprentices challenged the concept of restoration and a new influx of graduate apprentices challenged the concept of restoration and instigated the change to conservation in both philosophy and technique. The new conservators undertook practical training, including the study of organic chemistry and conservation ethics through secondments and study trips throughout Europe and here in the United States. The objective was to amass maximum knowledge and skills from peers and experts of the time. For a short period, and until the retirement of the last restorer in 1980, two workrooms effectively ran parallel to each other. One continued to reweave, while the other developed a purely conservation approach. The last two tapestries to undergo restoration were rolled up and put into storage in December 1980, both only partially rewoven. They would remain incomplete until a means of continuing with the work could be devised. Under the direction of the newly appointed Head of Tapestry Conservation, Jenny Band, two 17th century Mortlake tapestries from the Battle of the Sol Bay series were the first to undergo conservation treatment, including wet cleaning. And this is a detail from that tapestry where you can see the reweaving work. Um, they were both restored in the 1920s when a high percentage of degraded silk weft was removed and rewoven. Those are these areas here. By the late 1970s, the reweaving was still fairly sound. However, the dyes had faded dramatically, resulting in large rectangular areas of featureless woven silk weft. By now, just 50 years after the re restoration treatment was completed, areas of untreated, unsupported original silk weft were in an advanced state of deterioration. And those are the areas left around here. It is salient so that in the 1920s, when the restoration work took place, these areas were considered sound enough to be left undisturbed. 
Both tapestries were cleaned using the, using the cylindrical wash drum in the Victorian Albert Museum Conservation Studio. Minimal handling during this wash process resulted in reduced silk loss and was a vast improvement to the alternative, open courtyards and makeshift baths. Treatment of these first tapestries would concentrate on the overall support of the woven structure, strengthening all weak and fragile areas. Removal of the original, regardless of condition, would no longer take place. Previous repairs, including reweaving, would be left in place, now considered part of the object's history. Only unsightly, structurally damaging repairs would be removed, and all work at every stage documented in writing and photographically. To provide structural support, a fine linen fabric was applied to the entire back of each tapestry and fixed in place by evenly spaced, regular stitch lines. This provided a grid system of parallel lines running vertically when the tapestry was hung. And here you can see some of that early conservation work. The conservation couching down here on this side and the degraded areas where there's a lot of silk loss over here. Between these support lines, the close cost of conservation couching was applied throughout areas of weak and missing silk and wool weft. The level of degradation and fine weave dictated the closeness of the stitch lines. Areas of advanced weakness or loss required closer lines to prevent further damage and to define woven details. Stronger areas were worked with more widely spaced lines. And this is the back of some of that early conservation work. And you can see that the work is, in some places, much closer, and in others, more open. And in fact, down this area here, very little work at all. All slits, seams, alterations, and graph lines were strengthened and supported onto the backing fabric. Traditional silk threads were, for the first time, combined with modern polyesters. This blend was found to be most satisfactory both aesthetically and structurally. The polyester provided the long-term structural support and strength, whilst the use of silk or wool retained the original aesthetic appearance, quality, and continued the traditional use of natural fibres. Importantly, all areas were supported, spreading the weight load evenly and enabling these large, heavy textiles to continue to bear their own weight. The conserved tapestries were lined with lightweight cotton fabric rather than the heavy linen used by the restorers and were the first in the collection to be hung using Velcro contact fasteners. These new methods preserved the tapestry's integrity, woven image and structure and simultaneously returned definition to the overall design without the need to replicate it. The philosophy dictated that from a viewing distance the conservation stitching was not obvious. However, on close inspection, all work should be identifiable and, in theory, reversible. These are just some of the details of some of the condition of some of the tapestries that we've had to deal with, where you see great silk loss and bare warps. That's before conservation and after conservation. This is a detail from Abraham Tapestry before conservation and after. During this period, the tapestry and state furnishings workrooms were amalgamated forming the textile conservation studios. A conservation scientist, David Howell, was appointed and a full working laboratory established. Further staff were recruited, several of whom had completed postgraduate textile conservation training. A comprehensive program of collection care, maintenance, annual in situ surface cleaning, condition surveys, and environmental monitoring within the workrooms and state departments were devised and uh, established. The entire tapestry collection, previously hung using heavy-duty press studs, was systematically refitted with Velcro contact fastener. The conservation treatment of the first tapestry was evaluated on its completion and before any further work was begun. Now, for the first time, each tapestry was evaluated for its specific condition and requirements and a conservation plan devised accordingly. Working methods, materials and techniques were continually reviewed and improved as the experience, skills and knowledge of the conservation team developed. Preparation of conservation materials became standardised 
as trials indicated optimum for tensile strength. In-house dyed fabrics and threads, together with pre-dyed materials, were quality controlled as laboratory equipment and resources improved. This is the uh, fire of Hampton Court in 1986 on the South Front. Um, and the major fire was in the King State Apartments. And by this time, space and location had become in inadequate, and subsequently the workrooms and laboratory moved to spacious, well-equipped lo location on the northwest corner of the Tudor Palace. That's another shot of the aftermath of the fire of 86. And this is the new laboratory uh, just after we moved in. The new apartments completed in 1987 presented a unique opportunity to, de to design specialist equipment using purpose-built tapestry looms, tapestry hoist, and padded sectional tables. Additionally, the need for a tapestry cleaning facility was crucial. Drawing on past experience and research, a 7 by 11 metre tank was designed to, buy, to provide a safe method of cleaning large, fragile textiles. The wash bath provided a flexible approach with minimal handling, maximum control and continuous monitoring. Further research included the, the study of fibre degradation, cleaning investigations, pollution monitoring and tapestry support mechanisms that would directly influence the management of the collection. More recent projects, such as the European-funded MODHT, used cutting-edge scientific research to analyse the condition and rate of decay of tapestries in relation to, to their display history. The results proved alarmingly that the Hampton Court tapestries were more fragile than even the most pessimistic conservator had previously assessed. From the 1980s, decisions made within the conservation policy were taken with the primary objective of achieving the best value in effective treatment within a time scale that encompassed the whole tapestry conservation programme. A strategic roading programme was established in the mid-1990s after a comprehensive condition audit of the collection. This ran concurrently with the conservation and redisplay of tapestries led by the findings of historical research carried out by Tom Campbell the cleaning, conservation, and installation of tapestries damaged by the Windsor Castle fire, and with increasing pressure to compete within the commercial sector. For more than 10 years, the studio was obliged to cover 50% of its running costs with income generated from external clients, as financial support from central government diminished, and the palace was expected to become increasingly self-funding. In the five-year period from 1998, 29 tapestries were conserved for external fee-paying clients. During the same period, eight tapestries from Hampton Court were, com were completed, and there were continuous reviews and improvements in techniques, display, storage, and installation methods. The 1990s condition audit categorized all tapestries both on display and in storage, and prioritized conservation needs. Annual condition checks enabled any changes to be monitored and recorded using detailed digital images rather than any written descriptions that could be subjective. The system also identified alternative panels for specific areas of the palace, subject to size, date, and location. In this way, a rotational display could be possible, bringing tapestries out of storage that might otherwise rarely be seen. Tapestries requiring minimal structural support provide excellent projects for less experienced staff, developing knowledge and practical skills. By 1999, the treatment strategy highlighted tapestries that would form part of a formal training syllabus leading to the first master's course in tapestry conservation based at Hampton Court, and in 2003, to a three-year tapestry internship made possible by external funding. Additionally, Countless individuals have completed short-term secondments and work placements either as students, potential students, or experienced conservators as part of their training. The very scale of the tapestries and of the collection as a whole makes them a very special case within the textile conservation profession. Mastery of specialist skills is an extremely lengthy process. Above all, the tapestry conservator needs to have a flexible approach capable of development and change according to the needs of the collection, the tapestry or the client. Without the support of training or scholarship, 
the conservation of many tapestries will inevitably become either unattractive, unaffordable, or at worst, damaging. Both Hampton Court and its contents were designed to impress and entertain. It must continue to do so. From 1989, the palace has been completely self-funding, and consequently, there are enormous financial pressures in place. As one of Britain's top tourist attractions, there must, however, be a determination not to compromise in search of quick popularity. The potential for raising money is great, but the constraints are many. The goal is to preserve and maintain the palace and its contents for future generations, to make its history accessible, understandable and vivid. In 2001, David Howell developed the recoloration project, whereby the original colours were projected onto a small section of one of the Abraham tapestries. You can see the centre section here that's uh, more brightly lit. It gave an accurate and exciting impression of how tapestries would have appeared when new and was extremely popular when shown to small visitor groups. The project has now developed to enable an entire tapestry to be recolored while its narrative, gradual fading and conservation needs are explained in full. I know you've seen this slide. The other one's slightly better than mine, I think. But you can see the, um, the public sitting in the, the front. The display is open to all visitors and has proved hugely popular. Despite criticisms, the project compels the visitor to understand tapestry narrative and value, changing their, their perception and appreciation. And I know you've seen this one before too. Such projects contribute to making the tapestry's history informative, accessible and sustainable. The past five years, I've worked in private practice, working on a wider range of tapestry projects, training, coaching, and developing techniques that meets both the demands of best practice whilst being affordable in an, in an economy of dwindling resources and funding. During my years at Hampton Court, I was often asked why I'd stayed so long in the same organization. And my reasons were twofold. Firstly, I began my career working on one of the top collections in existence. Secondly, nowhere else could have provided such exciting and influential challenges and developments in the conservation field. The job changed around me. I feel extremely privileged to have been part of those changes. However, without the direction, intellect and energy of its head, Jenny Band, and the team that she inspired so greatly, none of it would have been possible. And I thank her on behalf of the team, the visitors, and the tapestries for that. Thank you.